think I'm going to stand here. Well, can you see me? I'm really short. OK. OK. Um, hi, I'm Rosa. Uh, I'm the publisher and editor of Serial. And thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I sent copies of volume five and six to be included in the gift bags for this weekend. And I see that they've ended up on your chair. So this is um, our magazine. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to flick through our publication and have a sense of what we're about. So I'm going to quickly run through our business because um, I don't want to focus on that during my talk today, but that you kind of know where we are with the business and where we're headed. So Serial is a quarterly travel and lifestyle magazine that we launched in December of 2012. So we're exactly one year um, and six month old this month. And um, we launched volume one with a print run of 3,000 copies, and volume seven is at 25,000. So that's been a nice growth for us. And uh, we're currently stocked in over 45 countries at some of our favorite shops, museums, and galleries, which is nice. And we've also collaborated with brands that we love and respect, like Mulberry, Anthropology, Toast, and Lolabo, um, creating exclusive <coughs> products, hosting exhibits and events. Um, as well as curating and producing content for them. Last December, we launched a second component to our business called Guided, um, which is a collection of online city guides. We launched Guided with 10 cities, and we've been launching a city per month, and we're going to continue to do that for the rest of this year. The site sits behind a paywall, which you can access with a one-year digital subscription fee, but we do offer the London Guide for free, so you can kind of see you know, the layout and the format, and you know what to expect with the other cities once you sign up. Um, but we are going to be printing the London Guide next month, so we are pretty excited about that. I think the lesson that I've learned is that everybody seems to really like print, so we're going to go for it. Um, and we've also, as he said, set up a creative agency this year, and we've been working with some really wonderful clients. Um, we do branding, we build and develop websites, and create assets for clients. And um, I really love that aspect of what we do, and we'll be formally announcing the agency with a portfolio at the end of this year. Um, last but not least, we're currently looking for a retail space because I wanted a showroom, a serial showroom to showcase our magazines, our prints, and some of the products that we produce because we'll be producing more later this year. And I think it'll be nice to have a space where our readers can come say hi to us and do a bit of shopping. And our office will be at the back. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so that's my business spiel. The way that I have structured my talk today is to share with you four key pieces of, of advice that have been given to me and have stayed with me. And these words um, have had a really big impact on how I work day to day and how I approach my business. So the first piece of advice that I'd like to share with you is from my dad. And um, he told me that the work that you create is always original, it's always different, by virtue of the fact that no two people are ever the same. So no two people can actually create an identical product, even if you try to. Um, so if you stay true to who you are in whatever it is that you do, the end result will have your stamp on it and will be innovative by the personal perspective that you are bringing to the table. No one else can have your perspective. That is yours and yours only. So you have to cherish it and capitalize on it. What you create will always be unique, simply because it's yours. And this is something that I've been repeating to myself like a mantra this past year and a half. Um, he told me this advice as I was starting Serial, and I was very overwhelmed by the concept of creative originality and how to achieve it in what seemed to me a very oversaturated market where everything had already been done. And I think that most people can relate to the anxiety of influence that you feel as you embark on a new creative project and want to add something new, something of quality to what already exists. And you ask yourself, how am I going to do this? Can I do this? And sometimes for me, this process of self-questioning gets neurotic. And I can get to a point of paralysis where I can't do anything because I have too much anxiety about the what ifs. And hearing that from my dad, that whatever you create, is unique because you are you and no one else is. Uh, really, it helped me a lot. It completely liberated me. And I no longer was trying to be different because I realized that whatever I create is already different because I am me, no one else is. And I think that concept applies to 
every single creative person. Um, and that really helped me uh, create Serial. And uh, at the very beginning of Serial, my p business partner and I used to do a lot of research about what was already out there, what exists, so that we were doing something new. Um, and I really realized that that actually had a negative impact on the work that we produced. Because whether you want to admit it or not, the stuff that you see and observe does have an influence on what you create, subconsciously, consciously. And we learn from that experience. And now when we create something new, we actually completely cut ourselves off from social media and the internet, go into a room and speak very honestly about what do we like, what do we not like, what can we do. And we reference you know, seemingly unrelated books and photos and places and art to feel inspired for the new project that we're doing. And I personally like to go through my books and my old photos because I want whatever we create to be unapologetically us. And... Um, I have been able to let go of a lot of the self-doubt that I had because now I understand that we are all individuals and personal instinct is what drives me on a day-to-day -day basis. The next advice is from my mom and it's something that she told me at the end of last year when she could tell how all-consuming cereal had been, become for me. And she reminded me of a really simple fact that I often forget, that your career does not define you and that you have to invest equally into your personal life. And I think uh, for a lot of people that have their own business or care a lot about their career, it's very easy to just throw yourself into what you do. And sometimes your personal life does suffer in the process. And uh, I think especially with the hours and commitment that a lot of us put in at the office, you know, we've all been guilty of that. And what your career is and what you do for a living is only a small part of who you are as a whole person. And we have to remind ourselves of that, I think. And although cereal is a huge consuming passion of mine at most times, at the end of the day, it is still a job. And if it doesn't work out, I can find another one. And I don't say that flippantly, like I don't care about cereal because that is untrue. I care about my business more than I can express and I have been giving it my 110% since I started. But I say that because no matter how important my business is to me, um, it just doesn't surpass the meaning my friends and my family and my hobbies have in my life. And they're my everything, they're what keep me sane despite the intensity of my day to day. And I would never sacrifice my relationship with them for my job. And that perspective is my anchor. Um, this kind of emotional detachment that I've learned to have towards my business, it gives me the courage to take risks and not always play it safe because I'm not afraid to fail. And I remember my parents telling me this when I started Serial, that I should be ready to fail every single day. So reality is always at my door. I don't think that makes me a pessimist because I still hope and I have big dreams for what we do, but it gives me the kind of resilience that I need to know that I will be fine no matter what happens. And um, I don't allow myself to get too carried away with what we do. My feet are always on the ground, and I make bus business decisions based on rationale rather than emotion and obsession. And it allows me to look at what we do as objectively as possible, um, and it keeps me humble. And when I do go off the charts crazy, because I do all the time, <laughs> it's always my friends and my family that give me the reality check that I need. And it's my hobbies outside of work that provides me with the balance that I need. And cereal is wonderful, frustrating, inspiring and challenging, but at the end of the day, it's just a very small percentage of who I am. And um, the third piece of advice was given to me by my former colleague, and it's one that his grandfather gave him. And he said, never apologize, never explain. Uh, when I heard that, I wasn't quite sure what to do with it, because I'm a people pleaser, some might say doormat, and I always over apologize and over explain. And I think I did that for most of my life, but a year and a half into running Serial, I think I finally understood the great wisdom in that advice. Um, I used to spend many, many sleepless nights, you know, worrying about what people think, what people say, am I doing this right, am I doing that? It was just crazy, like borderline insomniac. And um, it's a fool's game, and it goes in circles, because you realize that you will never 
please, everybody. And you're gonna offend and piss off a lot of people. So you have to grow a thick skin sooner or later because you just, you just have to make a peace with it. And uh, especially online, I mean, it gives people license to say very vicious things to you through you know, the internet, and you just have to let it roll off your back and stand your ground and be confident that whatever you've done is the right thing to do because it's your business and no one else can tell you really what to do and that's the great perks of being your own boss. And you should go you know, a little bit YOLO and do fearless things and just be confident. And I think don't explain, don't apologize for me. I take that as be confident and don't second guess yourself. Um, and when we introduced advertising to our magazine, which we did last volume after a year of no adverts, I was freaking out. We had a lot of internal discussions about, do we explain this to our readers? Are they going to be pissed because there's commercial elements to the magazine? And I almost felt compelled to write this like super long editor's letter, like part two, a blog post about why we had to have advertising in our magazine. But uh, I realized that that would be silly. Um, and I did it despite wanting to because I think I reached this point where I, I, I was like, why should I have to justify making what I know is the right business decision to make sure that we can continue to bring great content to our readership? And I, once I kind of realized that was true, um, I felt much better, like a huge burden had been lifted off my shoulders. And I also believe that our core readership understands that having adverts is a logical next step for a magazine like ours. And that instead of being offended, that they should be happy that we are growing and maturing. And some of them were. I got really kind emails from people, which is always nice. And I knew that I had done the right thing. And uh, we also let go of food in our magazine in the last volume. And that one, I think, was the really scary one. And this is where the never apologize, never explain kind of shifts. Because I didn't apologize, but I had to explain why we did that. So I think it's a fine line that you walk. Because I don't want to be a jerk, like I don't care, and I just do whatever I want. And that's the end of that. But I think I have learned the lesson that I should always be confident in the decisions that I make for what we do. And the last piece of advice that I am going to share with you today came from the amazing medium of a YouTube video. And um, it's the speech that Steve Jobs gave to the graduating class at Stanford. And I read his biography like 15 times. I think he's amazing. Um, and I always remember this one line, which is, you can only connect the dots looking back. And uh, that's very true for me. I have ended up where I am today in a very meandering fashion. Um, I got a degree in marketing and American history at university, and then I got my second degree in fashion marketing at Parsons. And uh, I worked in the beauty and fashion industry in New York for five years, and then realized it probably wasn't my calling, and I moved to Bristol to get a master's in English literature. Um, I remember sitting at my cubicle in New York. I was writing like a press release about mascaras for like the 50th time. And I think I realized this is not the kind of writing I was hoping to do at my job. So I decided to quit my job and move, which was random. And nobody understood why I wanted to do that, especially my friends and my family. And uh, I wanted to move to England, so I did. And uh, whilst... I was in school in England, I think I spent a lot of time regretting my past decisions, wondering why I had spent such a long time interning and working in marketing when I, that's not what I wanted to do anymore. Um, but then I realized that everything that I have done up until now actually has had a really big impact in a positive way with what we do at Serial. So yes, I worked in marketing and that seemingly has nothing to do with editorial, but it gave me the skill set that I needed to sell and promote our magazine. Um, and my, I guess, background in fashion and beauty, I mean, I'm naturally a very aesthetic oriented person so that informs the visual aesthetic of what we do and I think that's why we have ended up with a very visual magazine and um, my lifelong love of English literature which I've always had has brought me here um, I mean I don't know anybody in England when I moved here I just kind of did it on a whim because I said oh, I quite like reading English so I'll go move there and study for a bit and see how it goes so that that brought me here and um, this part is very weird and whenever I tell people they think I'm a little bit crazy, but the reason that I moved to Bristol is because I really love Massive Attack and Portishead, and um, I have never 
never visited Bristol before in my life before I moved to Bristol. Um, but I just kind of thought like, oh yeah, it's pretty cool. Like they've got a good music scene. I'm gonna go check it out. It's only a year. It can't be that bad. And I flew into Bristol Airport from New York. And I don't know if a lot of you have been to Bristol Airport, but to get into the city, you pass cow fields for about 45 minutes. So I remember freaking out because I thought it was going to be a city. I had my Blackberry and I was taking pictures of cows and sheep. I had never seen cows or sheep before either. And I was texting my friends like, I think, I think maybe I'm not at the right place. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it, it worked out in the end. It took me a period of adjusting to the pace of life, but it's wonderful. And I couldn't imagine being anywhere else now. And. Um, most importantly, kind of the peripatetic upbringing that I had just for, by like the family that I grew up in. I mean, I moved from country to country, city to city, constantly traveling, which I hated because you don't really want to do that when you're growing up. You know, your friends are having like sweet summer sleepover parties. You're getting dragged around somewhere in Europe and I didn't appreciate it. And I actually didn't travel for like three, four years while, whilst I was in university because I was so sick and tired of it. But then I started missing it. And then I realized, oh, I, I do like travel. I just complained because I was being a brat and wanted to make my parents' life that much more difficult. And, um, you know, I was, like he said, I was born in Seoul, Korea. I grew up uh, in between Vancouver and Seoul. And I went to university in Boston, worked in New York. I've also lived in Paris and Hawaii, and I've ended up here. And um, most people have a very strong physical sense of home, and that's the one thing that I often envy. But at the same time, I don't. And I feel great comfort and happiness when I am traveling. And that's something that I've realized. So I've made it my job, which is great. <laughs> now I make a living from traveling. And when people get to know this about me and everything that I've done up until this point, they tell me, oh, well, it's not very surprising that you've ended up as a travel editor. But for me, I only really realized that looking back very recently. So that's it. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.